looks like we're back on the Facebook Live. Is that right, Miss Alvin? It, it's thinking. Okay. It's redirecting. It takes a few seconds. All right. Okay. You're good to go. All right. We will go ahead and get started with the next uh, pr uh, process here of the presentation by the applicant or representatives and others in support of the application. And there's uh, 50 minutes allowed for this portion of the hearing. And before we get started, uh, Mr. Baker, um, if there's anybody in your group that uh, will be testifying that, that are not attorneys, I'd like to go ahead and get them sworn in. Team, for those of you that will be speaking uh, this morning, please uh, be prepared to be sworn in. Okay. Uh, is, all right, is Ms. Heisschew gonna do the swearing in? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Hines, you let's go ahead and get the uh, uh, the applicant and and the or the folks that will be speaking uh, from the, uh, for the presentation from the applicant uh, sworn in, please. We solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. Okay, and Mr. Baker, I would assume you will be leading the presentation here. Yes, sir. Let's go ahead and, if we can, share the screen, and we can put our PowerPoint up. Um, First, I want to introduce myself and the team, um, Mr. Chairman Jeffries, members of the commission, um, council, um, Mayor Rogers, and members of the public tuning in to this uh, application. My name is John Baker. I am an attorney in Louisville, Kentucky with Wyatt Tarrant and Combs. My address is 400 uh, West Market Street, Suite 2000, and I am it is my pleasure to be before you today on behalf of the applicant, the Rural Educational Association of Kentucky, we like to call TREAK, um, and we are here before you today as Amy presented to you for a proposal for a zoning map amendment to PUD, we call it the Brighton Heights PUD, uh, as well as the development plan approval and master plan approval request. Associated with those requests are waiver requests to the perimeter boundary buffer area, which we will go over in our presentation. Um, and as mentioned, the property at issue here today is 7400 and 7607 Friendship Drive with locations in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky, as well as uh, currently unincorporated Oldham County, as well as Jefferson County. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So this is what we are proposing today. Why a PUD? What, what are we going to be presenting to you today? Well, the property has been utilized for almost 100 years already as a location serving the health and well-being of its residents. And TREAK now looks to its future, and it proposes its next chapter in serving the community. And as you will hear today from Scott Edens and Susan Pena um, with the applicant, there is a, a discouraging trend that we are about to face in the next couple of decades with respect to an aging population. And that is not discouraging. What's discouraging is, is the decrease in caregivers, um, can, including continuing caregivers and caregivers as, as family members that will be able to help, help along this increase in the aging uh, population. And with their new vision, TREAK has a, uh, a plan in place that will kind of change the paradigm here for providing continuing care. And what better place than to do it on its campus here, Pee Wee Valley. Uh, it's something they're very proud of. Uh, the team here has worked diligently for um, a good part of this year in putting this plan together. And uh, we are excited to share it with you today. Next slide, please just some housekeeping items. Today, you will hear from Scott Edens, the, the president of Potentia Living, also with the Rural Education Association of Kentucky. Um, you will hear about the history that TREAK has with this property, uh, as well as what they're looking to do moving in the future. And then Scott will hand it off to Susan Pena, who will discuss what this new paradigm is for continuing care. Uh, what we are looking to accomplish here on this site is, uh, a mix of, of housing uh, for seniors and those that need care, 
uh, supported by a good amount of amenities all on site. So the idea here is with the, the property here on Friendship Drive, which is already well insulated from uh, its adjoining neighbors through a generous tree canopy that we wish to preserve. Um, they look to provide a very healthy environment for exercising this continuing care, uh, which will benefit not only its residents, but Peewee Valley, as well as visitors to the site. Um, also speaking today will be myself, Craig Kimmel, who is the architect on the project with RLPS Architects. Diane Zimmerman is available today. Uh, as mentioned earlier, she did perform the traffic uh, impact st study that is in the record. Uh, John Carmen will, has done the site work and will walk you through the site and, and discuss a number of uh, the components to the site, which go directly to Oldham County's comprehensive plan update. And Roger Harper is also available, the development advisory consultant. Next slide, please. Here is kind of the agenda, uh, just to give everyone um, a view of what we're going to present to you and in what order. Uh, next, I would like to introduce to you Scott Edens, who's the chairman of Potentia Living with TREEK. And he's gonna walk you through the history of the sites. And after Scott speaks, he will hand it off to Susan Pena, who will just discuss to you this exciting new uh, paradigm, this new model for continuing care for seniors. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners, uh, Mayor Rogers, uh, staff, and, and public and, and neighbors. Uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity to share with you uh, about our, our plans and, and our, uh, what we're here today to ask for. We're, we've been on this site in Peewee Valley, uh, which, which you know, is close to 50 acres uh, for the better part of 100 years. And we've been serving the community since 1924 uh, through TREC, which is uh, the Rural Educational Association of Kentucky. Some of you may remember uh, there used to be a, a hospital on site that was a real asset to the community. And, um, you know, unfortunately it closed in 1975. In 1969, uh, some 50 years ago, uh, the nursing home was, was built and has been serving there uh, exclusively for those last 50 years. And so Potentia Living uh, is a new uh, entity. Uh, we're we're uh, keeping Trek uh, as the owner, uh, but Potentia Living is a, a new uh, kind of a, a system parent organization. Uh, and so we put that in place to kind of take us into the, hopefully the next hundred years. I'd like to uh, give Susan Pena an opportunity to uh, share with you. She is our uh, development uh, coordinator for the team and uh, let her share about this concept. Susan. Thank you, Scott. So this first slide is uh, showing you some national trends and, and you're probably fairly familiar with these trends regarding the increase, dramatic increase in the number of seniors in our country. And so from 2020 to 2050, you can see by age cohort, cohort the dramatic increase in the number of seniors that is projected. So 70 plus, it's uh, gonna more than double. Uh, for the 80 plus, it'll be more than 250%. And for 85 plus, more than 280%. And it just increases from there as the age uh, brackets go up. Next slide. This shows the dramatic decrease in the number of caregivers, which really, if you think about it, makes a lot of sense because the baby boomers, the, the, the big body going through the Python has, is, has moved from being caregivers to being those to be cared for. And so from 2017 to 2020, the number of caregivers, which is defined as age 45 to 64 year olds, has decreased from 6.2 to 5.4 per senior. And by 2050, it's basically going to be cut in half, which is, which is from 2020, which is 5.4 to 2050. That's basically a 44% drop. 
So you've got this dramatic increase in seniors, dramatic, dramatic decrease in people to care for them. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about national trends related to chronic disease. So chronic disease is one of the most common, costly, and preventable of all problems in the U.S., and I think that's no secret. So heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, arthritis, obesity, Alzheimer's, et cetera. Um, Alzheimer's itself, just that one alone, is projected to increase by over 250% uh, between now and 2050. So they've been saying for a while that we're around the 5.4 million mark and that it's supposed to increase to 13.8 million. And actually that study is old. So I suspect it's probably projected to be more. Uh, so this year already, uh, they were projecting that 50% of all Americans, not just a certain age category, but all Amer Americans would be at least pre-diabetic pre or have diabetes. And most Americans are already insulin resistant. The next point is that 85% of all healthcare costs are related to chronic disease. And that chronic disease is primarily due to lifestyle. So therefore, improving lifestyle can prevent and reverse most chronic conditions and compress morbidity, which is the length of time you're sick before you die. So the, uh, the goal would be to live long, healthy, die short. Next slide, please. These are, uh, a, this is the slide from Oldham County's comprehensive plan that just highlights the percentage of the Oldham County population that is made up of seniors. Um, and as you can see, from, in 2010, it was about 9%. By 2050, it's, it's to be over 20%. Currently, we're at about 13%. By 2025, 15%. Next slide, please. Uh, this just talks about the ex, uh, significant growth in seniors in Oldham County just between uh, 2010 to 2020 and then projected for 2025. And the big takeaway here is that we're projecting for age 75 plus that that's going to be a 28% increase from 2020 to 2025. Um, the annual growth rate is about 5% a year. Up until this year, from 2010 to two, 2020, the annual growth rate was around 12%. Next slide, please. So this is taking the uh, population projection from the comprehensive plan. And as you can see, it's showing from 2020 to 2025, about going from about 75,000 to a little over 82,000 in total population, which is about a 9.75% increase. However, as I showed you in that previous slide, the senior population is going to increase almost 28% in that same time frame. So most of your growth is coming from seniors. Now, in terms of the uh, traditional life plan, continuing care retirement community model, this is what you're used to seeing, which is you have uh, usually up to four levels of care with community, community amenities and services. Um, one thing is probably missing from this that is, is becoming more of a trend is providing services out in the community, such as home and community-based services, et cetera. Next slide, please. And these are the typical services you're used to seeing related to healthcare. So assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing, short-term rehab, in home care, which could be uh, just assistant with activities of daily living, as well as maybe home health where you're getting some nursing services. The other component is typically outpatient therapy services, but it's usually located inside the nursing home. Next slide, please. So why are we here today? Um, as already been used the word paradigm, what we're looking for is a paradigm shift to healthy living and lifestyle within a life plan community located in Oldham County. And really the focus is on empowering seniors to prevent and reverse chronic conditions and, mo and mobility challenges. So then the question is, well, why bother? And the answer is so they can live a life of purpose with vitality. Everybody would prefer to be able to live their life till the very end with some sense of purpose that is meaningful to them, which is hard to do if you don't feel good. So the concept will be built on four pillars of positive change, and those are education, which then leads to providing hope, which requires support in a multitude of ways, and, and choice. And that's really in two ways, being able to make a choice and then having choices to choose from. 
So then the final question is why Oldham County and Pee Wee Valley and why now? To answer that question, I'd like to give you a little bit of background uh, from me. So I've been a consultant in the senior living industry for over 30 years. And my primary role in the last probably tw uh, 20 years of that has to be a researcher looking at the market, seeing what's going on, and then trying to figure out solutions if there were problems. So when we had the 2008 economic downturn, prior to that, the typical type of senior that would move into independent living in a life plan or continuing care retirement communities were typically fairly young. And when I mean that, I mean like um, early to mid 70s, typically couples that were very healthy and active and engaged in their community. And they were just planners. They were planning for their futures. They, they wanted to have all those other services on campus should they ever need them and not burden to their own children. When we had the economic downturn in 2008, seniors saw their portfolios go down, their home values go down. It was taking longer to sell homes. And so what happened is they got scared and they said, you know what, I think I'll just wait. And what they waited on was the health scare. So when they had a personal health scare of some kind, then they would make the decision to move in. Well, when they moved in, they were older, frailer with more chronic conditions. And that actually created a snowball effect for the industry across the, the country. So that what would happen is someone who was young, healthy and active, sure, they would see older, frailer uh, seniors with more chronic conditions living there. And they would say, you know what? I'm not ready for that yet. Uh, I'll wait even further. So that's the snowball effect that occurred in our industry. I looked at that and I said, you know, um, I became, let me just back up one moment. I became a Seventh-day Adventist back in 2000. And the reason that's significant is I learned that in the Seventh-day Adventist um, uh, faith, what, what we call the health message is a primary component of that faith walk. And what that really means is living a healthy lifestyle. And I knew what was possible with that. So my thought was, we really need to get the healthy lifestyle culture into the senior living industry. That will help reverse this snowball effect and take it in a better direction. Well, I started talking to my uh, colleagues about this concept 10 years ago. And the reaction of what I, I would get would be great idea, but they weren't willing to take it on themselves. And at the time, I really wasn't in a position to do so either. When I left the national firm I had been working with, I said, all right, Lord, I will take this on, but you have to lead or I will mess this up. And I had uh, contacted various colleagues about this concept to see if they would be willing to implement it in their existing communities. And the response I got was, great idea, Susan, has it been done anywhere else yet? In other words, nobody wanted to go first. So I realized I had to find an organization that understood this concept and was willing to take it on. And that's when I was introduced to Scott Edens and he told me about the background of Trake and that their original campus had uh, basically a lifestyle center on the campus and was providing education to nurses so they could uh, do what we're talking about here. And then of course, as you heard from Scott, they then added the hospital and then ultimately the nursing home. So that's the reason for why here and why now. Next slide, please. So health optimization, as we've already mentioned the four pillars of positive change, which is uh, education, hope, support, and choice. So here are the uh, components that we're looking at. And the first one being education, which would be, would be a lot of education on what is possible with lifestyle changes and the physiology of disease and the underlying causes of disease and what people can do about that. Obviously, healthy and healing foods is going to be an important component. Exercise is another key component that we can be supportive in. And then also providing a network of support. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of amenities, I'm not going to go through and list all of these, but I, uh, many of the amenities we will have are what you would typically see in a senior living community plus several additional ones that are really specific to supporting this concept. So one of those is, for instance, is a chef demonstration kitchen, where a chef can demonstrate how to cook some of these really healthy foods. And then if seniors want, kind of like hibachi style, and then if seniors want a bag of groceries to take back to their apartment and make it for themselves and, and to share, they can do so. 
uh, having a clinic with rotating specialists coming through the building, a dry sauna and massage, fitness center, gardens and greenhouses. Uh, we would like to grow our own um, organic uh, fruits and vegetables. Human physiology lab to help improve um, metabolic efficiency, but also to be a support for seniors who may not have been exercising all these years and want to make sure they're, they're entering into that type of program safely. Hydrotherapy, which is valuable for not only for mobility challenges, but also for improving in immunity. Um, outpatient therapy actually on our site so that they can literally go down to the common areas and receive outpatient therapy for any mobility issues they may have. Walking trails throughout the campus. One of the things we know that is the simplest and most effective exercise is walking. So we wanna empower them to be able to do that. And then a wellness marketplace and smoothie uh, juice bar. Next slide, please. And here's just some pictures of, this is not exactly what our campus will look like, but it gives you an idea in terms of food service. Next slide. Uh, educational services and, and lectures. Next slide. Uh, fitness facilities. Next slide. And that's it. I'm not going to turn it over, I believe, to Craig Kimmel, the architect. Yeah, I think I'm going. This is John Carmen. Okay, I'm thank you, John. From here. Uh, my name is John Carmen with the office of Carmen, 400 East Main Street, Louisville. Uh, we, we are the uh, site design engineering consultant for the project. Um, I, I'd like to uh, start out with how the site and how this project uh, can help meet these objectives that Susan has just uh, reviewed. I, I believe that each of you have a copy of the master plan report that was submitted uh, with the uh, application. Uh, in addition to a, an addendum that was submitted uh, that makes some minor clarifications and corrections uh, to the master plan report. Uh, th this master plan report is, is really shows a, an extensive and comprehensive effort, how this project can really be unique and it, it will be a, a very unique development that complies with the Oldham County comprehensive plan and, and the uh, zoning ordinance regulation. Uh, this master plan report, in addition to this presentation, it, it really does reveal how this project meets all of the regulatory tests that are necessary for this zone map amendment, including your zoning ordinance and uh, the, the provisions of uh, the uh, Kentucky Revised Statutes, uh, KRS 100. Next slide, please. So Brighton Heights is located in the uh, southwest part of Oldham County near the Jefferson County line uh, along uh, LaGrange Road, which is a, um, uh, a primary connecting corridor between Oldham and Jefferson County uh, located on an approximately um, a 49 acre uh, site. Next slide, please. So, so this project that you see, the, the boundaries in the yellow is, is about a mile and a half from uh, the Gene Snyder and, and easily accessible along LaGrange Road and, and also along uh, Reamer's Old Floydsburg Road. Uh, the, the site is actually situated between those two roads um, and could potentially be considered a, an infill site, which is certainly encouraged in, in your comprehensive plan. This site will have only two points of ingress egress, which are have been are currently and historically used, one off of uh, LaGrange Road and uh, an access point off of Old Floydsburg. There will be no other points of access or connection to any other surrounding neighborhood. Uh, the, um, the construction entrance, for the site uh, is planned right now for uh, the area off, or the point of ingress egress off of uh, Old Floydsburg Road to minimize, if not eliminate, construction um, uh, traffic off of uh, LaGrange Road. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to just uh, review some of the context of the site in the uh, um, adjoining properties. Um, the, the site, the 49 acre site is uh, situated uh, between the two roads that I mentioned. And the following slides will uh, demonstrate 
how this site is really uh, clustered in the center of, of our property uh, with remaining buffers, uh, the full perimeter. Next slide, please. So this is a view from Old Floydsburg looking to the north. You will see the east property line. You, you, you can barely see uh, Old Forest Road on the right-hand side. What is particularly important about this slide is, is that the very dense tree line, which uh, this is a leaf off condition, but the very dense tree line will, will remain and will not be uh, disturbed, creating a really significant buffer uh, between the residences and the, uh, the, the property. Uh, th this uh, particular photograph is taken from, uh, it's an aerial photograph, um, but if you're on the ground uh, as shown by Amy previously, um, because of this significant buffer, you probably would not see uh, the interior of the property. Uh, next slide. Likewise, this is a similar slide of the east property line, but looking from the north towards the south, showing the uh, existing Friendship Nursing Home in the foreground, but the uh, a very dense vegetation buff buffer on the east property line to the left that will uh, remain uh, preserved in, in the development capacity. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a view from the uh, northwest property line looking to the south along that west property line. Uh, even in this leaf off condition, which is somewhat transparent, you'll notice that the, um, the, the property line is well buffered uh, to the residences uh, to the west. Uh, you will see on the left hand side the kind of the core of the property uh, in which the development will, uh, will occur. Next slide. And this is a view along um, Old Floydsburg, Reamers Road, looking to the, uh, to the west. Uh, you'll see the, somewhat of the interior of the property. You'll see the uh, newly activated pump station that Amy mentioned. Uh, in the very lower corner is the location of the proposed um, ingress-egress point, which is approximately the same location as the, uh, the uh, older uh, point that, that has been previously utilized. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a view to the west from the interior of the property and the foreground is the uh, where the development, the core of the development will occur. But you also see the property line, which is uh, distinguished with uh, somewhat of the turf on the other side of the tree line. You'll see that it's uh, highly vegetated. Uh, this, most of this vegetation will remain. Uh, you're actually looking a little bit into um, the area that would be considered Jefferson County on this lower left-hand side. Next slide. Uh, th this is a, uh, a view looking to the east on the north property line, Pollock Avenue is to the left. Uh, this tree line likewise will be uh, preserved in the area that is open, there will be landscape enhancements made. You'll, you'll see the uh, existing nursing home in the background. Next slide. And just briefly before we get into uh, the architectural uh, and siting uh, part of this, uh, just wanted to mention uh, uh, several of the community um, uh, impacts or lack of impact actually. Uh, the site uh, has uh, considerable stormwater management uh, systems that will be enhanced with green infrastructure, all of which will be approved by your county engineer. Um, we, we know of no offsite drainage issues. We certainly will not be impacting any offsite uh, areas with stormwater management. Uh, sanitary sewer and, and conveyance of um, sewage is not an issue with the recent takeover of the system by MSD, there are plans of transferring and conveying all sewage to the uh, MSD Height, Height Creek treatment plant. Uh, we will be um, constructing and installing a new water system within the property that will connect the Pollock Avenue with uh, the Reamers Road area, which will improve uh, both areas. With, with that, I'd like to uh, turn this over to Craig Kimmel, who is a nationally recognized architect with RLPS that has been working on uh, building siding and the architectural. 
Thank you, John. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, thank you, commissioners and mayor and, and staff for, for the opportunity to talk about this exciting project. Uh, when we were first approached by Scott to talk about this, this project and the potential development on this site in, in Pee Wee Valley, the thing that we really got excited about was, was the intentional wellness that was, was obvious in, in all the things that were being talked about and, and how could the form of the development and the buildings themselves really support that wellness initiative. Um, so as we started looking at the site, we really wanted the, the travel distances and the walkability of the site to be front and foremost. It really had to work for for the seniors that were gonna be living there to allow them to live with vitality, to age gracefully. And, and as, as Susan said, to live a, a whole and fulfilling life till the very end. Um, so as, as we started developing this, we really wanted the community center to be literally in the center. So the yellow piece in this, in this plan is really a two story and one story structure that allows all of the different levels of, of development to kind of move to the center of the site. So it becomes kind of the magnet. It's kind of the focus, the focal point of the whole development becomes that community center. And the access drive kind of leads you right to that front door. Uh, then off to the left was it was it became really apparent that trying to keep that travel distance, the walkability from the apartments into the community center as short as possible. That does require a little bit more density. So, so that's really why we looked at that pink building as being a three-story structure. Um, and as, as Ms. Halen pointed out, there is a section that's four-story. It's really the inside of the loop that kind of faces south. So from the perimeter of the property, you really can't see that at all except potentially through the woods, kind of looking north off of Old Floydsburg coming, coming up to the end, but it is a kind of a daylight basement condition. So, so the buildings really are three stories with, with that one section because of the natural ravine that exists on the site, we really utilize that, that space to kind of drop that level so that the building really works with the terrain of the property. But keeping those apartments as close to the community building as we could and that really did two things. It limited that walking distance, but more importantly, I think it, it pulled those buildings away from the property line. So as John mentioned, uh, these buildings are significantly pulled back away from the property line. So those three-story pieces that are potentially through the trees uh, viewed, especially in the winter as the leaves are down, are, are really set back quite a quite a great distance from, from those property lines. Uh, and then introducing the, the duplexes, the one-story cottage uh, pieces that kind of wrap the perimeter, creating kind of smaller neighborhood groupings and, and the ability to kind of uh, create some meaning and some, some association between cottages uh, in different areas and in little pockets as you move around the site. Uh, and then off to the right of the, the community center, is the assisted living building and the, the memory optimization uh, structure. So assisted living is also a three-story structure. And then memory optimization is really one story so that the, the memory uh, optimization can occur both inside the building and in the kind of the garden structure that, that uh, sits plan south of that building. Uh, and then completing the loop road over the, the second phase with some additional duplexes and uh, some two-story structures, uh, which would be additional apartments that would have a daylight basement kind of to the low side so that we could basically tuck some parking under the building uh, and minimize that, that overall kind of impervious development as part of that second phase. All of this kind of focused around kind of the, the pond structures, which become kind of integral stormwater management features, but really become uh, outdoor amenities that, that really embellish that walkability and trail system. So even in the second phase, we can kind of walk through that garden and pond area to get up to the community center. Next slide. 
So as we started looking at this three-dimensionally, uh, a few things really became kind of apparent. One, we really wanted it to be contextual with Pee Wee Valley. We wanted it to feel comfortable. We wanted it to feel a little bit timeless, uh, but we also wanted to create this kind of energy and vitality uh, with how the buildings kind of started to be developed. So, uh, I, and I apologize, I think the slide was actually mislabeled uh, in Ms. Alvey's presentation because the, the, the three-story building on the right here are the apartments. So from the front entry, you really see those as a three-story structure, as I mentioned in the site plan. The community center is the two-story piece in the front. And then off to the, to the left is kind of the one-story wellness pool kind of area that, that is associated with the community space as well. Introducing some materiality, both in terms of, of siding types and also kind of the bringing that kind of stone element into the into the building just gives it a little bit of a of kind of a, a base and and kind of a timeless uh, ability as well. Next slide. This just is a close up of the community center. So as you come around that loop at the entry drive, we do have a port cashier, which allows people to get uh, into the into the community center under cover. Uh, and again, just just trying to, to introduce some different materials and different colors. Uh, one of the things that actually inspired us was the logo of Brighton Heights and the ability of the red, yellow, blue, green. Uh, and you'll start to see that kind of embellish itself in, in the different built forms. Next slide. So this is a, a view of one of those cluster areas where we have cottages that share a common green. Uh, so they have an entry on really on both sides. They, they have a kind of a more formal visitor entry on the street side, but they really live out the back and they share these common, common green areas, uh, typically as, as you kind of march around the site. This also happens to be kind of the flattest area of the site. So the ability for, for residents to walk from their, their individual cottages right to the community center. As Susan mentioned, that walkability uh, being very important that allows that, that to happen. And that's really why some of these cottage development areas are, are kind of nestled up fairly close to property lines in a few spots where the buffer is a little bit less because those are also the flattest sections of the site and give us the best ability to kind of create that walking connection to the community center spaces. And I think with that, I will turn it over to John. Thank you, Craig. Uh, appreciate that. And moving from architectural uh, standards that are also, again, a lot of these are uh, snippets that have been taken out of our master plan report. And the master plan report, um, I hope that you all have spent some time with the report because it sets forth a lot of details um, about the standards we're setting um, for the property, as well as how those standards meet Oldham County's comprehensive plan and uh, advances those objectives that are set forth therein. And with planning and site design, you know, one of the, the, the most important elements is setting up compatibility to the existing neighbors. And that's particularly important for an infill site, which this is. And um, along with the infill site, one of the main characteristics, not only of the site, but throughout Pee Wee Valley, a defining characteristic one sees is the tree canopy. Um, and that is something that's very special to Brighton Heights, not only for the property itself, for the future residents, um, you know, their peace of mind while walking through the, the property, uh, but equally, if not more important to our adjoining property owners. Uh, so that's why one of the reasons that when working with Oldham County planning, looking at the tools in the toolbox, what made the most sense to put together this site that the comprehensive plan slates in the future land use as institutional. Therefore, the comprehensive plan itself acknowledges that the property in the future will still be used to serve uh, a residential population in an institutional manner. But how do you achieve that through conventional zoning districts where you would have to blend together a blanket of different zoning districts? But then there's the PUD. And then speaking with Oldham County and, and Jim and Amy and working with uh, the guidelines of the PUD, 
we really saw this vision come together where you have the institutional element combined with varying degrees of residential elements from different levels of care to different densities to different positioning of the residential buildings on the property. That's just something you can't really accomplish using conventional zoning. Then adding on that this is gonna be one user on 49, but with dedication to old Floydsburg Road uh, and old Forest Road, we're looking at 47 net acres, but all contiguous. So that also fit a standard of the PUD and things started making sense. So after really pivoting and going straight for the PUD, things started to align. And not only did they align with the PUD requirements, but they also aligned with the, the objectives that are set forth in Oldham County's um, comprehensive plan update, which itself discusses and encourages more use of the PUD zoning district. Other standards you'll see in the master plan um, report deals with privacy fencing. Um, that's an example that's not specifically the exact privacy fence, but something we would look to uh, to utilize on the on the northwest side um, of the property that will also supplement the existing uh, tree canopy in some of those areas we realize that some of the tree canopy is less on the property line, such as the northwest section of the property, which is why we will also supplement that with privacy fencing. Uh, lighting design, um, we are very cognizant that adding no light pollution, especially beyond the property line, um, as well as through the campus. Um, so we will be making sure light is directed down, shielded, and we will not contribute to any type of light pollution leaving the site itself. Um, <clears throat> and then if the track were to be developed under its existing zoning, which you see as part of the request, we have kind of a mix of residential zoning districts and a small piece of commercial zoning but when put together, um, you can see that it does afford the property owner quite a bit of opportunity to develop the site in a much more intense fashion than what we're proposing today. Next slide, please. So also going back to the compatibility with neighbors, the, the grouping of the senior services on the campus, what we're looking to achieve here is the synergy of uses where residences can avail themselves of those uses on site um, with other residents they live with, therefore really lessening the need to leave the campus. Um, that combined with the tree canopy we keep referencing, you know, we, you will not be able to see the buildings from LaGrange Road and the existing forest canopy will also be supplemented with additional landscaping, additional trees, as well as privacy fences. Um, another huge um, feature to PUD zoning that was really instrumental in this site, and you can see it directly when you look at the development plan, is the clustering of the buildings. And we've mentioned that a couple of times, but it achieves a number of, of, of things here that we believe uh, is advantageous to everybody. One, site design. Um, we can put the buildings with larger massing in the middle and then use the perimeter for the smaller duplex, which are only one story buildings, which relate very well to some of the structures that are on the other side of the property line, if you can see them. Also with clustering, we can really create some uh, amenities for the site that also do double or triple duty with uh, environmental concerns, whether that's stormwater retention that is being able to be created into a, uh, a water feature, uh, but also amenities to look at and walk around. But as a whole, a generous amount of open space will be afforded on this site. And as mentioned by Mr. Carmen, we are not proposing connecting to any neighborhood streets outside of the, um, the property. Our two connection points are on Old Floydsburg Road and LaGrange Road. We understand that there has been some misinformation that has been um, disseminated out in the neighborhood. And we just wanted to reinforce the point that we have no intent to connect to any neighborhood roads now or in the future. Next slide, please. Here's a couple of key site statistics that just reinforce uh, the, the real ad, ad um, you know, the benefits we can get from PUD zoning. The proposed floor area ratio for our development is 0.22, whereas the current zoning allows up a, a, a FAR of 0.45. That's double the amount than we're proposing. And with that, 
we are offering over 23 acres of open space, which is double, more than double the required amount for this development. Um, I will say that the, the next metric that is on there is an incorrect metric. What we are looking uh, for there is that um, the 293 is not the units, the dwelling units that we would look at in a planning book and say, oh, that meets the definition of a, a dwelling unit, which that number is are uh, the equal units. That's a metric that's used by MSD and other sewer uh, capacity type uh, utility companies that when looking at various different types of housing, whether it's apartment or whether it's duplexes or single family housing, they try to make a metric that equates a dwelling unit to a dwelling unit to a dwelling unit. And uh, the, the proposal that we are putting forth is greatly less than what could be achieved under the current zoning of the property. Lastly, uh, for this slide, we comply with parking requirements. You can see that the parking is disseminated throughout the site. We look to avoid any large seas of parking for obvious reasons, environmental, uh, for cooling, um, and we want to be able to implement landscaping throughout the site. Therefore, disseminating the parking, putting them around where they need to be to serve the buildings has been accomplished with this, this, this site design plan. Next slide, please. Uh, Mr. Baker, let me interrupt you just a moment. Uh, just to remind you, you've got about a little over three minutes uh, on your 50 minutes uh, uh, left. And I will move, I'll try to zip through these last couple of slides. Uh, we probably have like four or five left. Uh, in front of you is, is a, a traffic discussion slide. We, we made reference to Diane Zimmerman's traffic report. Uh, this traffic impact study that Diane put together was agreed to by our agreed upon after reviewing it by KYTC. Um, Mr. Crumpton, the engineer for Pee Wee Valley, as well as Mr. Silliman, uh, the engineer for Oldham County. Uh, the big takeaways here are levels of service on LaGrange will remain the same as an A. The, the drop in level of service is on Friendship Drive approach to LaGrange, which still is above, which still maintains a D level of service, which Oldham County zoning regulations state that if you maintain a level of D from existing to no build to build, then no mitigation is required. Uh, and just one quick point on this, we realize the discussion that is going on amongst the, the, the various individuals from KYTC, Pee Wee Valley, Oldham County. Um, you know, we also understand that there's some conflicts in the recommendations that can, then a, that can happen, especially as it relates to LaGrange Road. Um, you know, we will be a part of those discussions. We agree with engineer, Mr. Silliman to continue discussions, to look to solutions uh, that will abate any issues at that intersection. Um, so we look forward to those conversations moving forward. Next slide, please. Again, here, here's just a picture of the perimeter landscape buffer. We've talked about this a number of times. Notable on the left side of your screen are those blue bubbles. Those blue bubbles represent the waiver areas that we are requesting relief from as it relates to the perimeter buffer requirement. Next slide. More particularly, this shows those dimensions. One that has changed is uh, the one on the Northwest, more North side. Uh, in, in the staff's presentation, it was stated that it would be a, we were requesting a 10 foot buffer. Uh, the standard between multifamily and single family for conventional zoning is a 15 foot um, buffer requirement. So therefore we will meet that 15 foot buffer requirement on the north side. But again, we will also supplement with trees and, and fencing um, to make that buffer and screening better. Um, one of the reasons for that northwest um, condition is Craig Kimmel mentioned the bigger buildings in the middle in the ravine there, the ravine pushes the building back a little bit, which pushes uh, the drive lane on this Northwest section back up closer to the property line, hence the trigger for the need for the waiver. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Again, more bullet points on the landscape buffer waiver. Um, what we are proposing exceeds the division 300 and the west property line will be enhanced with privacy fencing. The north property line will also be enhanced. Um, the east side is well buffered by existing trees that we will not disturb and preserve. Next slide, please. 
And this just brings in all comprehensive plan compliance. We have gone through a number of elements, uh, discussed components that touch on land use, transportation. Mr. Carmen talked about issues that discuss community facilities and services, as well as environment. Um, again, we have a robust open space. Um, we're gonna be having a very low to moderate amount of FAR for, for the 47 acres. And we are looking to develop an alternative housing for the seniors here that's in direct response to the comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. Again, this is your charge under KRS 100. You guys are familiar with this statute. We, we posit that we meet statute uh, subsection one that is in agreement with Oldham County's comprehensive plan, but also subsection A would apply in a bit that the, 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 uh, the future land you slated for is industrial, not industrial, I'm sorry, institutional. So what we're asking for is PUD that would allow for institutional mix with residential uses. Um, and that is also something that's encouraged by the Oldham County Comprehensive Plan. Next slide, please. Mr. Baker, I, I will remind you, your, your time has just about or has expired here. So I'll let you wrap up if you, if you could. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And with this slide, I will wrap up. Why the PUD? Um, for the reasons we've stated before, the PUD just offers a tool for a larger site like this that can be developed as one type of user. Here, a continuing care community that we're looking to institute a life plan community as described by Susan and Scott uh, previously, but also the flexibility in the design site regulations here allows us to cluster buildings, save trees, provide open space, um, all on one site. That is why we believe the PUD is the optimal tool in the zoning book for us and for this property. And with that, we really appreciate your time, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Uh, we'll entertain any questions that you have and uh, our team is available for your questions. All right, Mr. Baker, thank you very much. And uh, we'll have opportunity here in just a little bit to, uh, you know, for questions. Uh, uh, we're gonna allow the uh, uh, testimony and questioning to those opposing the application coming up. But I would ask, is there anyone on this uh, um, call that would like to uh, offer some, any support to this application? Anyone that would like to offer support before we move into the testimony? Okay, I don't uh, hear anyone or see any hands go up here. So uh, commissioners, let me ask you, um, do you want to move on into the uh, next uh, portion of the testimony and question is opposing the application or do you need to take a break here for a minute for a little bit? Are we okay with uh, with moving on or do we want to? May I, <clears throat> may I ask a question? Uh, who, who is this? My name is Ann Helton. I live on Dogwood Lane. Well, no, you'll, you'll have an opportunity here just a little bit. Uh, we will okay. get into that, that portion or whatever. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, would one, uh, just commissioners there, do we need to take a 10, ten minute break here? All right, let's continue on. Okay, all right, we can do that. Uh, with that, uh, we'll now move into the testimony and questioning by those opposing the application. You, uh, this uh, folks will have 50 minutes also. Now, what I'd like to do is um, um, let's get everyone sworn in. I know it's a little challenging to do uh, uh, with the Zoom format, but uh, I'll, I'll call on Ms. Haichu to um, uh, swear everybody in. And then when you uh, speak, uh, then I'd like to get your name and address for the record at that point. So uh, Ms. Haichu, if you would, let's, uh, let's swear in any folks that would have testimony or questions uh, posing the application. Okay. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Thank you. Wh uh, whoever would like to go first, like I say, we'll need your name and address uh, so we can get that for the record. Okay. My name is Jim Allison. Okay. And at 103 Castlewood Drive in Pee Wee Valley. That's at the corner. Uh, I own the property at the corner of Houston Lane and Mount Mercy. All right, go ahead. Earlier last week, I brought up to the Planning Commission some comments, and I hope you've had a chance to see those. Uh, if you have, I won't go through those again. Uh, if not, I can briefly touch on those. Uh, did, were you able to see those as far as the Planning Commission? Yes, well, I believe we everybody has received those, and you know, they're okay. in the 
Uh, I wanted to uh, briefly touch on the traffic study. I know it's been commented on several times and everything. Uh, I've looked through the traffic study myself and basically this appears to be a paper study rather than actual data that was collected. They used data from February, 2020 uh, provided by the KYTC and the area that they used was what they call B01, which is the area from the Oldham County line for about 0.6 miles into Peewee Valley. Uh, this data has no time stamps on it. So it's very hard to determine when uh, things are occurring. But when you look at the data, it says it's for Tuesday through Thursday. It does not address the other days of the week. Uh, also, it basically addresses the traffic along 146 and not the specific traffic going in and out of the Houston Lane crossing. Uh, that is an area which I feel, as several people have commented, is a major issue because we have St. Aloysius School, we have the uh, Jubilee Academy across the street. Both of these facilities have peak times in the morning and the afternoons where people are using that crossing. Uh, we have the backup from I-71, uh, which happens almost uh, a couple of times a month or more, and that backs up into Oldham County. We also have now the backup that's occurring up at um, the Westport Road 146 interchange, which backs traffic up today all the way to Foley Avenue, and that slows the rest of the traffic down. So I think the traffic study, although it addresses the 146 issue, not increasing volume on 146 is pretty good. It does not address the real issue in which I feel is the fact that we have the two crossings, from Friendship Drive and Houston Lane, which are offset by about 45 degrees. And people turning left out of both of these must cross each other's paths. Uh, several times, uh, we've almost had accidents there. Fortunately, we haven't had any. And just this past week, my wife was sitting at the crossing heading westbound. There was a car pulled up at Friendship Manor with no signal on. As the traffic cleared heading westbound, my wife began to pull out. The car at Friendship Manor whipped out and almost hit her broadside. So again, without some kind of control at that intersection, I think we're going to have issues. Um, I've, I've looked at the numbers that are on the traffic study. One of the peak numbers they show uh, heading westbound in the afternoon, excuse me, heading eastbound in the afternoon have a, as a six vehicle peak. When you look at the actual data that was presented, it's 12 vehicles, six was in a totally different hour of the uh, afternoon. So I, I think there's some issues in the fact that this was truly a paper study and not actual data collected on today's traffic in that area. And as we develop that area, we're going to have more service vehicles going in. People are buying off of the internet now. You had a lot of UPS trucks, FedEx trucks, uh, postal service, as well as food delivery and so forth that are really adding to the traffic congestion. And this traffic study doesn't address that at all. So, uh, and also we have more emergency vehicles that will be going in there. Uh, with more of the elderly residents, there will be more calls for the emergency vehicles going in and out. And that's also more of a danger. So I really think that that's the issue with the traffic study, uh, not the volume onto 146 per se, not increased. And I think both the county and the city of Peewee Valley need to be pushing the state to do something about that. I know it's a state issue, but it's directing, P it's affecting Peewee Valley. And uh, I just think that is something that needs to be addressed uh, as part of this approval process. I don't know how we do it, but I think we need to be creative and figure out a way to do that. Uh, also, one other thing, um, the it was shown today, you see the large trees along Friendship Drive, which go back into the facility. Those trees are getting older. And you also saw that we only are going to have two entrances into this facility, Friendship Drive and off of Reamers Road. The fire department access is, will be actually through Friendship Drive. And I think that, that it needs to be taken into account how we would get the fire department into this facility should some of these trees go down in a storm and there need to be in there. 
I don't know if that would mean we need to do something about right away going in there or take down some of the trees so that they can get in off of Pollock Avenue without trees being able to fall across or something like that. But I do believe we need to look for the future that we've had more and more trees go down in Pee Wee Valley over the years as the tree canopy gets older. And if we have a large facility of elderly residents back there, uh, I think the need says we have to plan for that. So those are my comments. Okay, Mr. Allison, thank you very much. Who would like to go next? Kevin? Yes. Michael Magister Washington? Yes, sir, Magistrate um, I have a, um, I guess uh, my question. Name and, I just name an address for the record. If you 112 would. Dogwood Lane, Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky, 4056. Okay, uh, go ahead. My question would be um, on the back side, see, I, I look at traffic patterns and I don't see people running out on 146. I see them going out the back side and running up the Reamers and Westport Road at the red light there. Is there any way or what can be done about aligning the back street, um, which I'll call Friendship Manor Drive, whatever that's called there, uh, aligning it to the Y where Reamers and Foysburg Road comes together so you don't have two different intersections running in and out, just like you don't have right now at Houston and um, Friendship Manor Drive. So I think something needs to be looked at aligning those two um, intersections up versus having it 50 to 100 feet apart from one another. I don't know if there's not enough sight distance as that's why they're leaving it where it is. Uh, but it looks like if you took down those trees, um, you would have the same amount of sight distance that you would have there. So I just would like somebody to um, answer those concerns for my, myself. Hey, let me ask uh, Mr. Irvin, uh, do, do you have anything that you'd like to add on that or, or be, respond to his question? Why don't we go through all of the questions and then we'll, because you've got 50 minutes, and then we'll start to address them because some of them are for the applicant and some like uh, Mr. Allison's question about the paper study of a traffic analysis, I can put some perspective on it. Okay. All right, Mr. Loxton, is that, uh, is that okay with you? We'll, we'll answer those here just a little bit. As long as they get answered. <laughs> okay. Any, anything else that you have? Oh, no, sir. Thank you. All right. All right. Let's move uh, next. Uh, is someone else have a question or testimony? I can speak. Um, yes. Major Hi, uh, I'm Amy Wellness. I'm a Pee Wee resident. I live at 7506 Locust Lane. Um, my mom uh, is also a Pee Wee resident. She lives at 110 Dogwood Lane. So she is a very close neighbor of the Brighton Heights project. Um, I'm under no illusion that anything I say is gonna make any difference, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak today and to address everyone. Uh, my main concern is the scale of this project. Um, we're talking a three, four story apartment building, 126 units. Uh, we're talking upwards of 30 duplexes, cottages, plus there's a lot of accessory buildings. It just seems uh, an extremely large project for Pee Wee Valley. Um, I did a little rough math, and if you take into account residents, staff, vendors, visitors, you're looking at easy 400 to 500 people on site daily, uh, which is just a drastic increase from what is there currently. Um, there are no apartment buildings in Pee Wee Valley. There are no condo developments in Pee Wee Valley. There are no townhome developments in Pee Wee Valley. So this just feels like a little bit of a detour from what Pee Wee Valley currently is. Um, I worry that this project kind of sets the tone um, and what this would mean for Pee Wee Valley going forward. I would hate for this project to kick down the door and let this kind of development be part of our future. Um, traffic is obviously a huge concern. I think we've talked about this intersection at 146 in Houston enough. Um, I drive it daily in different times of day, evening, morning, middle of the day. Um, I agree with everybody who has said it is a dangerous intersection. It is incredibly precarious. Um, one idea I had, it may have already been discussed at a previous meeting, it may not be feasible, but if you made the Brighton Heights Road one way and people could enter off of 146 and then exit onto Old Floydsburg, 
I thought that might be a way to sort of control traffic a little bit. I don't know Old Floridsburg nearly as well as I know 146, so that may not be feasible. My, my other concern with that is if you create a road there, people are gonna use it as a cut through. So then people who have no business at Brighton Heights um, are gonna be using that road to cut through from Old Floydsburg to 146. That feels like a really big hazard to residents. Um, so I think it's somehow you've got to control that either with the flow of traffic or with gatehouses maybe at each entrance. Um, other main concern is just noise. Um, they've proposed six years for construction. That is a long time for the neighbors to tolerate construction noise. I can't imagine anyone on this meeting or listening uh, on the phone or listening on Facebook um, would wanna live next to a construction site for six years. Um, once it's built, then you're dealing with the noise of having a little city right next to you. So dumpsters getting picked up early in the morning, obviously an increased um, emergency response. So there's gonna be more sirens. You're gonna have a lot of noise coming from you know, this fairly large development. Um, I am not opposed um, to the idea of a smaller boutique retirement community. Um, there are a couple that are close by. They're a little bit more in scale with their neighborhoods. Um, Magnolia Springs is right down 146. Um, it's a two-story building. It has some standalone like storage garage spaces. Um, and then down toward the intersection of 146 and Westport, uh, Forest Springs has a healthcare building in front and then 34 cottages in the back. Those are all one story. They kind of fit into their little pocket. Um, I think they probably attra affect traffic some, but I drive past for both of those daily um, and don't see a whole lot of traffic buildup or traffic issues from there. Um, when I look at the overall scale of this project, um, and the negative impact on our infrastructure, it just doesn't seem like the right fit for Pee Wee Valley. Um, I would like today the board to not approve any zoning changes, to deny the landscape buffer waiver, um, and for Brighton Heights to reconsider the scale of this project. Um, directly to Brighton Heights, I would say, be a good neighbor. You are moving into our town, so you need to adapt to our lifestyle. We should not have to adapt to yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, who would uh, like to go next? I would. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ann Helton, 113 Dogwood Lane. Okay. Uh, Mr. Baker said, uh, made the comment, there will be no connection to the existing neighborhood streets. Although we received a flyer that said that uh, Dogwood Lane would be uh, an access to Brighton Heights Senior Living Center. So that seems to be a conflict right there. Okay, I th we'll address that you know, more here in just a little bit, but I, I think that's been corrected in the, the testimony that's been provided by the applicant. By Dr., I mean, by Mr. Baker, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. Okay, well, I also wanna say one other thing. If people go along uh, Old Floydsburg, uh, they will want to get up to 146. And that will be all the streets along here uh, to, that they can come up. Uh, uh, Dogwood Lane is, is a very, very narrow street that people could not go up and down and would cause hazard to the people who live here. The tre tr street would have to be widened. And I wanna make that comment. Okay. Okay, okay. Right. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else? as testimony or questions. Yes, I would like to speak. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Robin Tanzo. I live at 109 Dogwood Lane. Um, I agree with what Amy Wellness says. Um, we have a lot of little kids back here. One in particular has some um, health issues and if she would get away from her parents, um, we would have serious issues. I've already had two dogs hit back here this summer and we would have traffic coming back here on Dogwood Lane because people would get lost. The people that don't know the area. Um, I, I personally think this would be an eyesore for us residents on Dogwood Lane. Um, 
I don't live on the back side of that property. I live across the street, but I can see because my living room is higher up. So I can see traffic going down Friendship Manor. I can see the lights, the outside lights. And I agree with Amy, if we're if it's gonna be approved, it needs to be a smaller scale. This seems to be way too big. Um, and I've talked to some of my other neighbors, the one that would be directly affected by it, and she cannot be on the phone call today. And I know probably what I'm gonna say doesn't matter, but um, she's totally against it. And that's all I have to say. I just, I, the, just the traffic around here is a nightmare in itself with even at, not even adding this. It, at certain times of the day, it takes you 10 minutes to get out on the street. So I just, I don't agree with it at all. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to testify or have questions? Anyone else? Okay, I don't hear anyone. If, if there, we, you still have some time left here on this, uh, you know, on this portion. If there's anyone that has already asked a question and has, uh, you know, has another question or, you know, another statement, uh, you're certainly welcome to do that at this time. All right, I don't hear anyone or see any hands go up. So um, we will uh, close, I guess, this portion of the uh, questioning of the, uh, or, or, excuse me, questions and the, uh, posing the application or testimony. So um, let me ask the commissioners, um, before we get into the questions from the commissioners, do you all want to take a break or do you wanna move, uh, move forward with, the, uh, with our questions? What's the pleasure of the commission? Can we take a short break, Mr. Chairman? Sure. We will take a, about a 10 minute uh, break here and then come back into session and we'll move back, move into the questioning of the applicant and those opposing the application by the commission. So at Thank this you. point, uh, we will take a 10 minute break and, and come back online here at about uh, uh, 20, about 1120, 1125, or 1121, excuse me. 